Welcome to Paranormal Pages. Let's get straight into the true scary stories. Whispers in the Walls It started as a soft murmur, like the distant hum of a radio left on in another room. I first noticed it when I moved into the old house, a Victorian relic nestled in the shadow of a dense forest. The estate agent had given me a knowing smile, the kind that said, you won't last long here. But I shrugged it off, the house was perfect for me, spacious, secluded, and, best of all, cheap. I was a writer, and the solitude promised by the creaking wooden floors and dusty, forgotten corners seemed ideal for my craft. The first night, I barely slept. The walls groaned as the house settled, the wind howled through the cracks in the windows, and those whispers, faint, barely audible, seeped through the plaster. I told myself it was just my imagination, the product of too many late nights and too much coffee. But deep down, I knew something was off. There was a strange weight to the air, a heaviness that pressed down on me as I lay in bed, staring at the shadows dancing across the ceiling. Days turned into weeks, and the whispers grew louder. I would hear them when I sat at my desk, trying to write, or when I was making dinner in the small, outdated kitchen. They seemed to follow me, weaving through the air like smoke, curling into my ears, and settling into my mind. Sometimes, I could almost make out words, disjointed phrases that evaporated as soon as I tried to focus on them. I convinced myself it was the house's age, the way old wood and plaster tend to creak and settle, and nothing more. But the whispers persisted, a constant, unsettling background noise that gnawed at the edges of my sanity. One evening, as the sun dipped below the horizon, casting long, twisted shadows through the tall windows, I heard something different. The whispers weren't just random noises anymore, they were coherent, forming sentences, stringing together thoughts that weren't my own. The door, they said, it's open. I froze, the hair on the back of my neck standing up. My heart pounded in my chest as I slowly turned to look at the front door. It was ajar, swinging slightly on its hinges, though I was certain I had locked it. A chill ran down my spine, and I slammed the door shut, locking it again with trembling hands. That night, sleep was impossible. I lay in bed, every creak and groan of the house amplified in the silence. The whispers had grown bolder, their voices clear and almost conversational. They spoke of things I couldn't comprehend, of dark places, forgotten rituals, and names that sent shivers through me. I tried to block them out, covering my ears with a pillow, but it was no use. The voices had found their way inside my head, and they weren't leaving. And then, just as I was about to slip into a fitful sleep, they said something that chilled me to the bone. Tomorrow, you will find the truth in the cellar. My eyes snapped open, my breath caught in my throat the cellar. I had never been down there, hadn't even thought to explore it. But now, the idea of it consumed me, filling me with a dread so deep it felt as though it would swallow me whole. What truth could the voices be hinting at? What was waiting for me in the dark, damp cellar of this cursed house? Hey! Subscribe for more true scary stories. The following morning, I awoke with a sense of foreboding that clung to me like a second skin. The voices had been silent since their cryptic message, but their absence was more unnerving than their presence. I could feel the weight of their unspoken words pressing down on me, driving me to confront whatever lay beneath this house. Despite the gnawing fear in my gut, I knew I had to go to the cellar. It was as if the house itself was pushing me toward that dark, unknown place. The cellar door was located in the kitchen, a small, unassuming hatch in the floor that I had hardly noticed before. As I approached it, my heart pounded in my ears, drowning out the silence that had settled over the house. The whispers had not returned, but the atmosphere was thick with tension, as though the very walls were holding their breath. With trembling hands, I reached for the iron ring embedded in the wood and pulled. The hatch creaked open, releasing a rush of stale, cold air that smelled of damp earth and decay. I hesitated at the top of the stairs, staring down into the darkness below. The steps were old, worn smooth by years of use, but now they looked treacherous, leading down into an abyss from which I might not return. But the voices had promised truth, and despite my terror, I couldn't ignore the pull of curiosity. I grabbed a flashlight from a drawer, clicked it on, and began my descent. 
the cellar was deeper than I expected. The stairs seemed to go on forever, and with each step, the air grew colder, the darkness thicker. My flashlight flickered, casting long shadows that twisted and writhed like living things. When I finally reached the bottom, I found myself in a large, stone-walled chamber that stretched beyond the beam of my light. The floor was uneven, covered in dirt and debris, and the walls were lined with old, rusted shelves filled with broken tools and forgotten objects. But it was the oppressive silence that unnerved me the most, complete and unnatural, as though the cellar existed outside the bounds of the world above. I ventured deeper into the room, my footsteps echoing unnervingly in the confined space. The walls were damp, and strange symbols were etched into the stone, their meaning lost to time. They looked ancient, older than the house itself, and as I traced them with my fingers, a wave of nausea washed over me. There was something terribly wrong about this place, something that shouldn't be. I could feel it in my bones, a primal fear that screamed at me to turn back. But then, I noticed something at the far end of the cellar. The beam of my flashlight caught a glint of metal, a small, ornate box, partially buried in the dirt. It looked out of place among the decay, its surface covered in intricate carvings similar to those on the walls. I knelt down, brushing away the dirt, and carefully lifted the box. It was surprisingly heavy, and as I held it, a chill ran through me, colder than the air in the cellar. My hands shook as I fumbled with the clasp, and when it finally gave way, the lid swung open with a creak. Inside was a collection of yellowed papers, brittle with age, and a small, leather-bound book. I picked up the book, its cover worn smooth, and opened it to the first page. The handwriting was spidery and difficult to read, but as I scanned the text, my blood ran cold. It was a journal, detailing rituals and incantations dark magic meant to summon and bind forces beyond comprehension. The final entry was dated over a century ago, and it ended with a chilling phrase, the voices demand a sacrifice, and in return, they shall reveal the future. As I read those words, the whispers returned, louder and more insistent than ever. They echoed in my mind, a cacophony of demands and promises, each one more terrifying than the last. My vision blurred, and the cellar seemed to spin around me. I dropped the journal and staggered back, the whispers growing louder, drowning out all reason. Blood, they hissed. Blood will set us free. I bolted for the stairs, my heart pounding in my chest, the whispers chasing me as I fled. I didn't stop running until I was back in the kitchen, slamming the hatch shut behind me. But even then, I knew it was too late. The voices had been released, and now they were everywhere, filling the house with their relentless, maddening chatter. And as I stood there, gasping for breath, I realized with a sickening dread that they were no longer just predicting the future, they were controlling it. The house had changed. I could feel at the moment I emerged from the cellar, a palpable shift in the atmosphere. The walls seemed to close in around me, the air thick with an oppressive weight that made it hard to breathe. The whispers, once confined to the background, now permeated every inch of the house, seeping through the walls like a foul miasma. They were no longer content to remain on the edge of my consciousness. They wanted to be heard, demanded it. I tried to leave. I packed a bag, grabbed my keys, and headed for the door. But as I reached for the handle, the whispers surged, a chorus of voices screaming in unison. The door slammed shut with a force that rattled the windows, the locks clicking into place on their own. Panic gripped me as I pulled at the door, but it wouldn't budge. It was as though the house itself had decided I wasn't allowed to leave. Let me out! I shouted, banging my fists against the wood. But the only response was a mocking laughter, a cruel, echoing sound that reverberated through the walls. The whispers taunted me, promising escape if I did as they asked, if I made the necessary sacrifice. But I refused to listen, refused to be a pawn in whatever twisted game this house was playing. In desperation, I ran to the windows, but they, too, had sealed shut. The glass was cold to the touch, unyielding under my frantic attempts to break it. I was trapped, and the realization struck me like a blow to the chest. The house had become a prison, the whispers my jailers. And somewhere deep within, I knew that they wouldn't let me go until I had fulfilled their demands. Hours passed, or perhaps days, time had lost all meaning. 
I wandered through the house, a hollow shell of myself, the whispers gnawing at my sanity. They whispered of blood, of ancient rites and forgotten packs, of a darkness that hungered to be released. I tried to drown them out, blasting music, screaming, anything to silence them. But nothing worked. The voices grew louder, more insistent, until they were all I could hear, all I could think about. I began to see things, shadows that slithered along the edges of my vision, figures that disappeared the moment I turned to look at them. The house twisted and warped, rooms shifting and changing when I wasn't looking. I would turn a corner and find myself in a hallway that hadn't been there before, the walls lined with portraits of people I didn't recognize, their eyes following me as I passed. The whispers told me their names, their stories, each one ending in madness and death. Sleep became impossible. Whenever I closed my eyes, I was assaulted by visions of the cellar, of the box and its contents. The journal's words etched themselves into my mind, the rituals playing out in vivid detail behind my eyelids. I saw myself standing in the cellar, the book open before me, a knife in my hand. The whispers guided my movements, coaxing me to carve symbols into the floor, to chant the words that would bring them what they desired. One night, as I paced the darkened halls, something new appeared, an old, full-length mirror at the end of the corridor. I didn't remember it being there before, but nothing in this house was as it seemed anymore. Drawn to it, I approached, my reflection warped and distorted in the glass. The whispers fell silent, as if holding their breath, waiting for me to act. I stared into the mirror, my reflection staring back, but there was something wrong with it. The eyes looking back at me were too dark, too wide, and there was a malevolence in them that wasn't my own. My reflection smiled, a slow, creeping grin that twisted my features into something monstrous. It's time, it whispered, though its lips never moved. The words were inside my head, woven into the fabric of my thoughts. The mirror rippled like water, and before I could react, a hand shot out from the glass, cold and clammy as it wrapped around my wrist. I screamed, tried to pull away, but the grip was like iron, dragging me forward. My reflection stepped out of the mirror, fully formed, and it was only then that I realized it wasn't me at all, it was something else, something that had taken on my shape. It leaned in close, its breath icy against my skin, and whispered in my ear, you can't fight us. We are part of you now. Embrace it, and the pain will stop. I struggled, but the more I fought, the tighter its grip became. I could feel the coldness seeping into me, numbing my limbs, clouding my thoughts. The house seemed to close in around me, the walls warping and twisting, the whispers merging into a single, unbearable shriek. And then, just as I felt myself slipping away, it released me. I stumbled back, gasping for breath, my heart pounding in my chest. The reflection was gone, the mirror shattered on the floor, shards of glass glinting like teeth in the dim light. But the whispers remained, a constant, maddening buzz in the back of my mind, growing louder with each passing moment. I was unraveling. The house had taken something from me, my reflection, my sanity, I wasn't sure what. The whispers had embedded themselves deep into my mind, twisting my thoughts until I could no longer tell where they ended, and I began. Every attempt to resist only fed their power, and every hour spent in this accursed place sapped my will. The house had become an extension of them, and now, so had I. I avoided the mirror shards scattered across the floor, each one reflecting a different version of myself, each one more monstrous than the last. The whispers were louder than ever, no longer hiding in the shadows but speaking directly to me, guiding me with a chilling intimacy that made my skin crawl. They had one message, repeated over and over, complete the ritual, and it will all end. In the back of my mind, I knew what they wanted. I knew what the cellar, the journal, and the voices all pointed to. It wasn't just a sacrifice they demanded, it was a communion, a joining of our worlds through blood and dark magic. They needed me to finish what had been started long ago, and the thought filled me with a terror so profound that I could barely move. But the alternative was worse. I had seen what would happen if I resisted, the house would consume me, body and soul, until nothing of myself remained. I was already slipping, losing control of my thoughts, my actions. If I didn't act soon, I would become just another ghost within these walls, another whisper in the dark. 
With trembling hands, I retrieved the journal from where I had left it on the kitchen table. The pages were stained with age and something darker, something that smelled of iron and decay. The final ritual was outlined in excruciating detail, every symbol, every word meticulously recorded. I read through it with a numb detachment, the whispers encouraging me, coaxing me to do what they asked. When I finished reading, I knew what had to be done. The voices were relentless, urging me to return to the cellar, to complete the ritual and bring them into our world. My body moved on its own, as though controlled by an unseen force. I grabbed the knife that had been hidden beneath the floorboards, a ceremonial blade, old and rusted, but still sharp enough to draw blood. The house seemed to guide me as I made my way back to the cellar. The walls groaned, and the floorboards creaked under my weight, but the door to the cellar opened easily, as if inviting me in. I descended the stairs, the air growing colder with each step, the darkness thick and suffocating. The whispers intensified, filling the space with their maddening chorus. When I reached the bottom, the symbols on the walls seemed to glow with an eerie, pulsing light, and the air was thick with the scent of earth and rot. I moved to the center of the room, where the dirt had been cleared to reveal a stone altar. The voices guided my hand as I began to carve the symbols into my flesh, each cup precise, following the lines laid out in the journal. The pain was distant, a dull throb that barely registered as I worked. Blood dripped onto the altar, and the whispers surged, filling the room with a deafening roar. The walls seemed to close in around me, the air crackling with energy. I began to chant the words from the journal, my voice trembling but growing stronger with each syllable. The symbols on the walls pulsed in time with the rhythm of my words, and I could feel the barrier between our world and theirs thinning, weakening. As I reached the final verse, the room erupted in a blinding flash of light. I was thrown back, the knife flying from my hand. The air was alive with energy, the ground beneath me trembling as the fabric of reality tore open. For a moment, I glimpsed something on the other side, dark, formless shapes moving in the void, eyes that burned with an unholy light. The voices were no longer whispers, they were screams, filling my mind with their terrible, ancient hunger. And then, just as quickly as it had begun, it was over. The light faded, the room falling into darkness once more. The whispers were gone, replaced by a silence so profound that it hurt my ears. I lay there, gasping for breath, my body trembling, my mind reeling. But I knew, deep down, that it wasn't over. The cellar door creaked open, and I heard footsteps descending the stairs, slow, deliberate, each one echoing through the chamber. I tried to move, but my body wouldn't respond. I was paralyzed, helpless as the footsteps drew closer. A figure emerged from the shadows, tall and shrouded in darkness, its features obscured but I didn't need to see it to know what it was. The whispers had returned, not as voices in my head, but as a physical presence. The figure loomed over me, and though it had no face, I could feel its gaze, cold and unforgiving. It reached out, a hand extending toward me, its fingers long and twisted, like the roots of some ancient, malevolent tree. And then, it spoke, its voice a low, guttural rasp that reverberated through the air. The ritual is complete, but the price is not yet paid. I tried to scream, but no sound came out. The last thing I saw before the darkness consumed me was the figure leaning closer, its hand inches from my face, and the realization that I had unleashed something far worse than the whispers, something that would never let me go. Hey! Subscribe for more true scary stories. Story 2 The House of Silent Nights the house was old, far older than I had first imagined. Standing alone at the end of a long, twisted road, it loomed over the countryside like a dark sentinel, its windows like empty eyes staring into the void. When I first saw it, I was drawn not by its decrepit exterior, but by the strange sense of comfort it exuded, like a long-lost memory that tugs at the edge of consciousness. It was the kind of house that called to you, whispered your name in the dead of night, made you believe it was meant for you and you alone. The previous owner, an elderly man named Mr. Caldwell, had died under mysterious circumstances. The townsfolk refused to speak of him beyond a vague murmur or quick glance over their shoulders. I didn't care. 
I was desperate for a fresh start, and this house was both affordable and isolated, just what I needed. When the realtor handed me the keys, she also gave me a small, yellowed envelope. These are the house rules, she said, her voice low and hushed, as if afraid the walls might overhear. You'll want to follow them. I chuckled at the absurdity of it. Rules for a house? What could possibly go wrong? But as I opened the envelope later that evening, the humor quickly drained away. The paper was old, brittle at the edges, and covered in a spidery script that looked ancient. The first rule jumped out at me immediately, never look out the windows after midnight. Beneath that, a few other rules followed, equally bizarre, but less unnerving. I tossed the list aside, convincing myself that it was nothing more than an eccentric quirk of the late Mr. Caldwell. The first few nights were uneventful, though the house was far from quiet. It creaked and groaned in the wind, its wooden beams stretching like an old man shaking off the dust of centuries. But the rule about the windows gnawed at me, a seed of curiosity that grew with each passing night. Why would someone make such a strange demand? Was it superstition, or did it hide something far more sinister? On the fourth night, I woke to the sound of footsteps. They were light, almost imperceptible, but distinct enough to freeze the blood in my veins. They seemed to be coming from the hallway, just outside my bedroom door. I grabbed a flashlight, telling myself it was just the house settling, but the beam shook as I held it. Slowly, I opened the door and peered into the darkened hallway. Nothing. No one. But when I turned back, I saw it, the window at the end of the hall. The one rule I should have followed. Midnight had come and gone, and now the window was wide open, the curtains fluttering as if something, or someone, had just passed through. My breath caught in my throat as I moved closer, unable to resist the pull of the darkness beyond the glass. And then, as if in answer to my unspoken fears, I heard it, a faint whisper, a voice calling my name from the depths of the night. I knew I shouldn't, but the need to look was overwhelming, a force beyond reason. As I reached out, my fingers trembling, the whisper grew louder, more insistent, until it was a cacophony of voices, all screaming in a language I couldn't understand. And just as my hand touched the cold glass, I saw it, a face, twisted and hollow, staring back at me with eyes that had seen unspeakable horrors. I stumbled back, gasping, and slammed the window shut, drawing the curtains tight. The voices stopped, but the terror remained, clawing at the edges of my sanity. I could still feel that presence, lurking just beyond the glass, waiting for the next midnight. Sleep eluded me after that night. Every creak of the house felt like a prelude to something dreadful. The list of rules now sat on my bedside table, a constant reminder of my transgression. I stared at it in the morning light, fingers tracing the worn edges of the paper. The first rule had been clear, never look out the windows after midnight, and I had foolishly ignored it. The consequences had been immediate and terrifying. But what of the other rules? What more did this house have in store for me? The second rule was simple, yet chilling, do not enter the basement after sunset. I had yet to venture down there. The basement door was locked, the key hanging on a rusty hook in the kitchen. It had seemed insignificant at first, but now, knowing the malevolence that lurked within these walls, it felt like a ticking bomb. What was down there that I wasn't supposed to see? The fear gnawed at me, growing stronger as the day progressed. By dusk, I could feel the house changing. The air grew thick, oppressive, as if the walls were closing in around me. I couldn't shake the sensation that I was being watched, followed by something unseen. I tried to distract myself, wandering from room to room, but the silence was heavy, pregnant with a dark promise. When the last rays of sunlight slipped below the horizon, I felt it, a pull, deep in my gut, leading me toward the basement door. My hand trembled as I picked up the key. The rational part of me screamed to leave it be, but curiosity, damned curiosity, pushed me forward. I had to know what lay beneath the floorboards, what the previous owner had hidden away. I unlocked the door, the hinges groaning in protest as I opened it. The smell hit me first, a musty odor mixed with something foul, something that made my stomach churn. The stairs creaked under my weight as I descended into the darkness. 
my flashlight barely caught through the thick gloom, revealing a clutter of old furniture, rotting wood, and shattered glass. But as I moved deeper into the basement, the clutter gave way to a clear path leading to a large, ornate chest in the center of the room. Its surface was carved with strange symbols, spirals, and faces that seemed to shift when you weren't looking directly at them. I knelt before the chest, my heart pounding in my ears. The lid was slightly ajar, as if beckoning me to look inside. I hesitated, remembering the faces I'd seen in the window, the voices that had haunted me since that night. But the pull was stronger, drawing me in like a moth to flame. With a deep breath, I lifted the lid, and immediately wished I hadn't. The chest was filled with bones, human bones, bleached white and arranged in a chaotic jumble. But it wasn't the bones that made my blood run cold. It was the skull, resting on top, its eye sockets filled with something red, glistening in the beam of my flashlight. The crimson substance dripped slowly, like thick blood, pooling at the bottom of the chest. I stumbled back, dropping the lid with a loud thud, and the room seemed to shudder in response. And then I heard it, a low growl, rising from the shadows around me. Something was down here, something angry, awakened by my intrusion. I spun around, the flashlight flickering as the growl grew louder, closer. The shadows moved, coalescing into a shape, a hulking figure with glowing red eyes. It was massive, filling the narrow space, its breath hot on my face as it loomed over me. Panic surged through me, and I bolted up the stairs, slamming the basement door behind me. My hands shook as I fumbled with the key, locking it just as the door rattled violently. I could hear the creature on the other side, snarling, trying to break through. I backed away slowly, the rules now echoing in my mind like a warning. I had broken the second rule, and now the house was punishing me. The house had taken on a life of its own after the events in the basement. Every shadow seemed to crawl with unseen eyes, and the walls whispered secrets I wasn't meant to hear. I hadn't dared to return to the basement, leaving the chest and its gruesome contents locked away. But the knowledge of what I had seen gnawed at my sanity, twisting my thoughts like a knife in a wound. The third rule was ominously straightforward, cover all mirrors before sleeping. I had discovered it the next morning, scrawled in the same spidery handwriting on the crumbling list. Unlike the first two rules, this one seemed almost laughable until nightfall. As the darkness crept into the house, the mirrors, scattered throughout each room, took on an unnatural glow. Their surfaces shimmered with a faint light, as if reflecting something that wasn't there. I spent the evening pacing, every nerve on edge. My eyes kept drifting to the mirrors, which now seemed to pulse with a life of their own. I considered covering them, following the rule as instructed, but a part of me resisted. What would happen if I didn't? What was it that Mr. Caldwell had feared so much that he felt the need to hide it from view? Unable to resist the pull of the unknown, I left the mirrors uncovered that night. As I lay in bed, sleep eluding me once more, the silence was deafening. Every creak of the house felt amplified, every gust of wind like a howl. But it was the mirror across from my bed that held my attention, its surface reflecting only darkness, until it didn't. I must have dozed off, because when I opened my eyes, the room was bathed in a pale, ethereal light. It wasn't coming from the moon, or any source I could see. Instead, it emanated from the mirror, which now glowed with a soft, inviting light. I sat up slowly, heart pounding, and stared into the glass. At first, I saw nothing but my own reflection, ghostly and pale. But then, the image shifted, the reflection of my room distorting and warping until it showed something else entirely. The reflection no longer matched the room around me. Instead, it showed a different place, a room similar to mine, but decayed and rotting. The walls were covered in black mold, the furniture splintered and broken. And in the center of it all stood a figure, a woman, her back turned to me. She was draped in a tattered gown, her hair long and tangled, obscuring her face. I couldn't look away. My body was frozen, paralyzed by the sheer wrongness of what I was seeing. The woman began to turn slowly, her movements jerky, unnatural, as if she were a puppet on strings. When she finally faced me, I gasped, a cold dread seizing my heart. Her face, or what was left of it, was a hollow shell, skin hanging in tatters, 
eyes dark voids that seemed to pull at my very soul. She moved closer to the mirror, and as she did, the room around me began to change. The walls darkened, the air grew thick with the stench of decay. I could feel the dampness creeping up the walls, could hear the floorboards rotting beneath my feet. It was as if the reflection was bleeding into reality, the boundary between the two worlds collapsing. The woman reached out, her hand pressing against the inside of the mirror, fingers splayed as if trying to break through. I watched in horror as cracks began to spiderweb across the glass, spreading outward from her hand. The mirror trembled violently, and I knew that if I didn't stop this, if I didn't break the connection, she would cross over, into my world. In a blind panic, I lunged for the mirror, grabbing the sheet I had ignored earlier and throwing it over the glass. The light vanished instantly, the room snapping back to its normal state. I collapsed onto the floor, gasping for breath, my body drenched in sweat. The house was silent again, but the damage was done. I could feel it in the air, in the very bones of the house. I had broken the third rule, and now, there was no going back. The End Subscribe for more true scary stories. Thanks for watching.